Hey everybody, today we're going to talk about child on child sexual abuse because it's not often talked about and there are so many issues and misconceptions out there, which is why today I want to offer 10 must know facts from shame to abuse cycles and trauma to parental response and so much more. And really quickly on the topic of trauma, I want to remind you that my new book Traumatize is available now. In it, I talk about what trauma is, how it can feel, and of course, how we can heal from it. You can order your copy today by clicking the link in the description or find it wherever books are sold. Unfortunately, children abuse other children. This could be because they themselves are being sexually abused by someone or have viewed sexually explicit materials and are acting out of what they saw. This isn't commonly talked about because it can be hard to imagine it happening and even harder to view a child as a perpetrator but it is very common and therefore it's important that we discuss it, which is why I'm going to explain the 10 must know facts about it. So let's get into it. Like, yeah. Right. It's, it's the thing that sucks about it is cause I've been deep in it for like a couple of, I don't know, probably like a month now, I guess reading is that because it's a child, you, it's not like it's their fault, but it is. So the people who are abused by another child, like I had a patient years ago who was abused by another boy and like, it fucks with your head because you, you can't put them in jail because they're hurt too. But then like you're hurt. It's so the first fact is that child on child sexual abuse is abuse. It can have the same effects on us as any other kind of abuse. And the reason for that is regardless of the perpetrator's age, what happened to us was a sexual act that should not have happened to a child our age. That can be overwhelming to our system and cause confusion, shame, guilt, embarrassment. It is a trauma and we will need to heal from it just as we would from any other trauma. An analogy that was shared with me to further explain this fact is that a kid can accidentally shoot another kid with a gun, regardless of whether they are old enough to understand the permanence of death or what a gun can actually do when fired. The other child has still been shot and suffers all the same effects. Now I know that that may sound intense and that analogy might be a little overwhelming, but it does a good job of explaining why child on child sexual abuse is abuse. And before we get into it any further, I do want to define this term child on child sexual abuse because many struggle to understand what's normal sexual development in children and what's problematic sexual behavior. What's normal is based on what's age appropriate for the child. So normal sexual exploration for young kids is more about curiosity around their own or others body parts and how they work. And if they involve another kid, no one really feels pressured or forced to participate. Normal behavior for preteens would include starting to masturbate privately, and they might have romantic relationships that include things like consensual hugging and kissing with other kids at the same levels of maturity. It's normal for other older teens to have relationships with each other that might or might not include sex as long as it's consensual. Now problematic sexual behaviors in children and adolescents are those that are unusual for that age group and occur in situations where there's significant age, power, or developmental differences. And they tend to be coercive, secretive, or excessive. Okay. Does that make sense? And yes. that was just a lot to run through like the, the second fact is that the age of the perpetrator isn't the only important or defining factor. In many cases of child on child sexual abuse, the one doing the abusive things isn't much older or even is possibly younger than the victim. So even if, for example, you were eight and your abuser was six, that doesn't mean that it couldn't be abuse. The truth is knowing about sex can be what gives them power, not just age, size, or strength. Also, it doesn't matter what sex the child who initiated the abuse was or whether they use threats or violence, whether or not there was force is not the only factor in whether something was abuse or not. We can all be manipulated or coerced into doing things, especially when we're children, not to mention that we don't often understand consent or are too young to even give it. So even if we agreed to participate, that doesn't mean we wanted it or even understood what was happening. And I know that shame comes along with that and abuse tries to tell us that, you know, we should have fought back harder or known better, but the truth is 
we were a child too. And we might not have known that what was happening was abusive or how to get out of the situation. And don't worry, I will be digging into shame in the next fact and in fact seven, so stick around for more about that. The third fact is parents and other adults don't often know what to say or do about it. The discomfort parents can have with sex and talking about sex with their children lets those of us who are in pain down. And it's important that when a child comes to us telling us that someone has hurt them or touched them in their private places, that we believe them. Too often, parents and other adults will just chalk it up to kids being curious and experimenting or decide to never talk about it again. Those responses only compound the shame we already feel about what happened to us. And don't worry, I'm gonna talk a lot more about that a little later in this video. But those responses, or lack of them, feed into the false beliefs that it wasn't that big of a deal or it wasn't actually abuse and we're just overreacting or that we brought it on ourselves and are to blame for what happened to us. As parents and responsible adults, we need to do better. And I will dig into some of those ways that we can better support and help our children heal in the next few facts, so stay tuned. Fact number four is that talking about this will help. I've heard from parents that they worry if they make too big of a deal about the abuse, that it will only make it worse for the child. And they just want their pain to go away, so they stop talking about it altogether but talking about it openly and honestly will actually do the opposite. And no, I don't mean you know sharing all of our own adult reactions with our child, but being open to conversations with them about what happened and how they feel is really important. And being aware of things like shame and guilt popping up can really help. For example, when our child tells us something happened, we show worry, care, and concern and let them know that they can tell us about what happened and we'll keep them safe. And do your best to not react with upset or disgust, okay? Much of what children need in times like this is to feel heard, understood, and most importantly, protected from any further pain. If we try and sweep the issue under the rug, our child won't feel any of those things and instead will most likely blame themselves for what happened. So please, when it is brought up, Manage any of your own discomfort and give your child the room needed to speak about it. And don't drop the subject after one conversation. Keep checking in and let them know that you're there to help if more comes up. It's the best way to help them in their healing process. Which rolls nicely into fact number five. Getting our child into therapy right away is best. Now, I know many parents and children can worry what will happen if we tell a therapist or other professional about the abuse. And don't worry, I will dig deeper into that process in fact number nine, so stay tuned for that. But therapy is important because we can heal from these traumatic events, which I also touch on later in this video, but we know that the sooner we are able to talk through and process a trauma, the less likely it is to be stuffed down and develop into PTSD or other mental illnesses, things like depression, anxiety, or even borderline personality disorder. Make sure you talk with your child about this, letting them know that you want them to find someone they're comfortable talking with. Offer to sit in on a session or two if they want, and while making sure they do go to therapy, let them guide the rest of the process. We don't wanna take away any more of their power or confidence but we do want to make sure that they get the help that they so desperately need. Also, as a patient, know that therapists do tell parents some things said in therapy if we're under 18 years old. So it's best to ask them what will be kept between you two and what will be shared. That way there aren't any surprises or trust broken if the therapist needs to tell your parents something that you said. Overall, the sooner we get in to see someone and start talking through the abuse, the better. And if possible, find a therapist who is trauma informed. The sixth fact is that shame and disgust can come along with this type of abuse or really any type of abuse. But when we are harmed by another child, it can be hard for us to understand what happened and think that we must have done something to cause this. When we're young and don't have all of the information or understanding about a situation, we use what we do know to try and make sense of it. And what we usually know the most about is ourselves and our role in what took place. Meaning that we are likely to blame ourselves for the abuse. 
and for not knowing better or saying no. Most of us might've even felt shame because some of what happened could have felt good to our bodies. Or we might have even had an orgasm, which is common in sexual abuse because that's just how our body parts are designed to work. We can think that something must be wrong with us to let that happen. And we can start to doubt ourselves or who we are and what we're capable of. Not to mention that if we are finally coming to terms with this as an adult, it can disgust us that this happened to us at such a young age. We can struggle to even talk about all that happened because we realize now just how adult those abusive actions were. And it can be a lot to process. Moving right on to fact number seven, hypersexuality is often a result of childhood sexual abuse. And this can happen when we are abused by an adult or another child, because when we are sexualized from a young age, meaning before we would naturally be interested in it, we can find ourselves masturbating, but not knowing why we're doing it or even what we're really doing, or even engaging in other sexual acts. And while I know this can sound odd, we can do this as a way to process what happened and try to make sense of it. Kind of like if we repeat the behavior enough, we will understand it better and it will stop being so upsetting, which can cause us to engage in sexual behaviors following the abuse. It has nothing to do with our feelings about it or what we like and don't like. Many of my patients and viewers have also talked about how the abuse affected their sexuality long-term and how many went through years of being sexually promiscuous as a way of trying to take back the power and making their own decisions about sex, even if they maybe weren't the healthiest for them. Just know that all of this is perfectly normal and something that should be talked about and processed through in therapy as well. The eighth fact is, even though many children were first abused themselves, they are still responsible for the pain that they caused. It's often believed that children don't know what they're doing and therefore can't be held accountable. Sure, a child may be too young to really know what it was that they were doing, or maybe abuse happened to them, which I'll touch on in my next fact, but that doesn't make their actions any less hurtful to the child that they were doing it to. In general, it's safe to say that just because one person doesn't know what they are doing is hurtful, doesn't make it any less so to the person they're doing it to. You know, does that make sense? We are all responsible for our actions, especially those that hurt other human beings. And we are all capable of abuse, no matter our age. Unfortunately, in many cases, but not all, children who abuse other children have first been abused themselves. The abuse that they endured explains why they did what they did. Remember that last fact about hypersexuality? That's what I'm talking about. But that only explains it, right? That doesn't excuse it. Just because we know why a child acted the way that they did doesn't mean that they didn't also cause harm. A child who harms another child needs treatment so that they can stop. Most children who have abused another child don't go on to become abusers as adults and treatment helps make sure that that doesn't happen. Fact nine, if a mandated reporter like a therapist or a teacher finds out about the abuse, child protective services will get involved and investigate. Now this process is a bit confusing, so I will try my best to simplify it. And this is how it works in the US, but keep in mind that it may be different in other countries. So when your child tells me as a therapist and a mandated reporter that they were abused, I have to report this to CPS or Child Protective Services. Now this means that I will have to fill out a form with the child's name, address, what happened, and as much information as I can gather about the abuser, the other child, right? Their name, address, phone number, age, uh, school they go to, et cetera. They will also ask if I think this is happening to other children, like if the child who initiated the problematic sexual acts is around a lot of kids and could have an opportunity to harm someone else. And yes, I know in this case, we are talking about children who harm other children. So they're gonna be around other kids, but I'm just walking you through the questions and what the protocol is. Then CPS will take the information that I gave to them and investigate. They will probably come by your home and speak with you and your spouse or partner, and they may wanna to speak to your child, the one who told the mandated reporter about it, or any other children in the house. If the child who initiated the problematic sexual acts doesn't live in the same household, 
they will do the same at that child's home. Then they will decide the next best action, meaning does the child who initiated the problematic sexual acts need to be placed into a treatment center or taken to jail or juvenile detention center or other things like that. Overall, they just want to check to make sure that things are safe for the child who was abused and decide on best actions to take regarding the child initiating the problematic sexual acts. And finally, fact 10, we can heal from this abuse. I know a lot of what we talked about today could have been hard to take in and difficult to process, but know that getting in to see a therapist and working through the abuse you sustained is really best. I know it's tough and trauma work sucks, but with the right help, it can and will get better. What you experienced was abuse. It doesn't matter who did it or whether or not you were able to fight back and you deserve to feel heard, understood, and validated as you work through to process it all. It can get better. You can heal. So please speak up, reach out, and get the help that you need and deserve.